welcome to the Foraging in a Nutshell Foraging Class. My name is Brian, and I'll be your instructor and forager at large for the duration of this class. In this class, we learn about the best wild foods in the state of Michigan and the botany we need to know in order to identify those wild foods. Botany is the science of plants, and we need to know a few things about botany to make sure that the plants we find really are what we think they are. Obviously, with so many dangerous plants out there in the wild, you don't want to make any mistakes when you identify things, and knowing a little botany will help you prevent those mistakes. So, the way this class works, I'll start things out with an appetizer on foraging in general and then I'll serve the main course of wild foods. Now, the main course will be on a month-by-month -month basis as the wild foods become available to us, and I arranged all the wild foods that way to help you gain a sense of when they're ready to harvest. Everything has a season, and as a forager, you need to be aware of those seasons. So, with thousands of plants out there in the Michigan countryside, you may be wondering, where exactly do I begin? And how do I tell the safe plants from the harmful plants? Well, the place to begin is with the plants that we cover in this class. And the way you tell them from the harmful plants is by making sure that they have the right combination of features. You see, every species is unique in some way and we see what's unique about them by observing a very specific combination of features. And when you know that combination, you can unlock a plant's identity. Now, as a forager, you should know that plant identification can be extremely easy or extremely difficult. It just depends on what you're trying to identify and where you're trying to identify it. You should also know that differences between species can be very obvious or very subtle. The differences are almost always there, but in order to see them, you need to know what features to look for. So throughout this class, I'll show you those features. Another thing a forager should keep in mind is that the word edible doesn't always mean fit for consumption. In fact, you really need to be careful with the word edible, because it often means barely edible, even after preparation. Now, for the most part, the wild foods that we cover in this class are safe to eat, reasonably palatable, and well documented in the historical record. But there are some exceptions, and we'll handle those exceptions as they arise. Also, as a general guideline, if something doesn't smell like food or taste like food, it's probably not food. And I say this because a lot of things that are said to be edible certainly don't smell like food or taste like food. And some of those things can actually harm you if you don't prepare them right. Another thing that foragers should be aware of is that in the art of survival, there's a procedure for testing the edibility of unknown plants. And this procedure, which is called the Universal Edibility Test, is probably similar to how the first humans on Earth figured out which plants they could and could not eat. Now, although this test is good to know, it's an extremely dangerous test that should only be used in an actual life-or-death situation. So unless you're in that situation, I would not recommend doing this test. Remember that only a small percentage of the plants on Earth are edible, so the universal edibility test is more likely to fail than to succeed, and that is not a test that you want to fail. Another thing worth knowing is the importance of habitats. Although some plants can grow just about anywhere, quite a few plants are very particular about where they grow. And knowing that a plant prefers a certain habitat tells us where to look for it. So simply knowing the habitat makes a forager's job a lot easier. 
And if you thought that you had to travel hundreds of miles to some remote wilderness to be in the right habitat, then you definitely thought wrong. You can forage anywhere, even in the middle of major cities. In fact, quite a few of the plants that we cover in this class feel right at home in major cities. So wherever you are, you're never too far away. Throughout this class, I'll show you things at various times of the year. And I do that because in order to identify things, you often need to see them at various times of the year, such as when they're in bloom and when they produce fruits. I'll also show you various signs that can lead you to a meal. Signs like unripe fruits that tell you where food will be in the near future. Withered plants that tell you where to dig for roots. Trees that might have nuts below their branches. And colonies of dried plants that tell you where young shoots will arise when the growing season returns. And one last point to finish our appetizer on foraging in general is that to be good at foraging, you don't need to know hundreds of plants. You only need to know a few good ones. So there's really not that much to remember. Now, it's true, the more you know, the more options you have. But regardless of how much you know, the number of good options is still very limited. And we'll cover just about all of them in this class, beginning in the month of January. I know this may come as a complete surprise, but you can find things to eat in January. Now, you're not going to find very many things, and the things you find may not be in very good condition, but there are definitely things to eat in January. So, if you're out there foraging in the frozen landscape and wondering, why am I foraging in this frozen landscape? Or I mean, what is there to eat in this frozen landscape? Well, look no further than roses, sumacs, cattails, and believe it or not, pine trees. Anyone foraging in January should definitely be looking for these resources. Now, these aren't the only resources in January, but they are some of the best ones, so we'll take a look at them. And just to be clear, this class is not going to teach you everything there is to know about every plant that's out there in the forest. That's not the purpose of this class. The purpose is to teach you what you need to know about some of the best plants. And what you need to know is how to harvest, process, and identify those plants. So that is what we'll focus on. Roses are prickly shrubs that produce fruits called rose hips. And since only roses produce these fruits, that feature, in combination with prickly stems and pinnate leaves, is a sure sign of roses. Now, you probably won't see too many leaves in winter since most of them fall off, but you should see fruits, and those fruits often stay fresh all winter long. As you look out onto the frozen landscape of winter, you notice that not too many shrubs or trees have fruits. So the presence of fruits in winter is actually a very distinctive feature. Remember that when you identify things, what you don't see can be just as informative as what you do see. Roses are one of just a few shrubs that have fruits in the winter and we'll learn how to harvest and process those fruits a little bit later when we cover roses in more detail.
For now, I just wanted to show how to identify roses in winter. Sumacs are another potential resource in winter, and they're easy to find because they really stand in contrast to the rest of the landscape. Now, to identify most of them, you're looking for trees with clusters of red, hairy fruits at the tips of bare branches. Nothing else looks like that in winter, so you're not going to have much trouble identifying them. As for their edibility, their fruits are the part that we eat, and I'll explain how to harvest and process those fruits a little bit later when they're in season. Plus, we'll also cover poison sumac, which has white fruits rather than red fruits. Winter foragers should also be looking for plants called cattails because cattails have edible rhizomes and edible seeds. And just in case you don't know, roots and rhizomes are two completely different things. It's true that rhizomes basically look like roots, but rhizomes connect plants to other plants, which is something that roots never do. Another thing you should know if you don't already know, is that digging things up in winter is a real workout. And if the ground is frozen solid, you're probably not going to get through, or you'll spend more energy getting through than what the food provides in return. So even though cattails thrive in marshy areas all over the world, harvesting the rhizomes in winter may not be possible. Now, Assuming you can get the rhizomes, then I'd suggest making cattail flour, or cattail cakes. To make the flour, simply bake, dry, grind, and then sift the rhizomes. And to make the cakes, boil the rhizomes in water, mash the rhizomes as they're boiling, Filter the rhizomes out of the water. Continue boiling the water until it becomes a thick paste. And then dry the paste into cattail cakes. Both of these preparation techniques produce excellent results. As for cattail seeds, harvesting the seeds is much easier than harvesting the rhizomes. But since the seeds are 99% fluff and only 1% seed, they're not a very practical source of food. They are useful for other things like insulating a coat or starting a fire, but they're not so useful as food. So, overall, using cattails as food in winter is not without some problems, but despite those problems, they're a wild food worth remembering and we'll learn some other ways that we can use them as food a little bit later when they're in season. Whether you believe it or not, the inner bark of pine trees is edible. 
Now, to be honest, the first time I heard that, I didn't believe it. And even after eating pine bark a few times, I still didn't believe it. But regardless of that, according to the history books, pine bark, as well as the inner bark of a few other trees, was an important source of food for Native Americans. Now, I didn't say that it was a pleasant source of food or that it was easy to chew, but it was abundant and available all year long, and it's that abundance and availability that made it so valuable in the past. As a forager, you should know that trees have inner bark and outer bark, and that only the inner bark is edible. It's also good to know that inner bark is also called phloem or cambium, both of which are specific layers of tissues that make up the inner bark. Now, distinguishing these layers is not necessary because they're both edible, but you do want to avoid the outer bark, which is usually a lot darker and a lot drier than the inner bark. So, what's it like to eat pine bark? Here's the deal with pine bark, and tree bark in general. Although it does have some calories, it's very difficult to digest because it's mostly fiber. And it's also very difficult to chew, especially if the tree is a hardwood. As for its flavor, that depends on the kind of tree you harvest, but in general, it tastes like wood. So, if you make flour out of inner bark, it'll probably taste more like sawdust than flour. As for harvesting and processing pine bark, ideally you want to harvest the bark from a lower branch rather than the main trunk. And that's because harvesting it from a lower branch won't harm the tree, but harvesting it from the main trunk can do a lot of damage, or it can even kill the tree. So, with that in mind, after peeling your bark off a lower branch, you can eat it fresh or pound it into flour. Now, if you eat it fresh, keep in mind that it's more like gum than food, so you'll definitely be chewing it for a while. If you asked me, I'd say that pine bark is best when made into flour. And if you make flour out of it, I'd recommend drying it before grinding it, and then using modern food processing equipment to do the grinding. Now, you can also do it the old-fashioned way between two rocks, but that's a lot easier said than done. Although we can eat the inner bark of many different trees, I'd recommend trees in the pine family, and that's because, number one, they have the softest wood, and number two, they're easy to identify, even in winter. To identify them, just look for needle-like leaves in combination with woody cones. No other evergreen trees in Michigan will have that combination of features. And pine trees in particular are unique in having their leaves occurring in bundles. And one last thing about pine trees is that in addition to their inner bark, they also have edible sap, shoots, and pollen cones. Plus, their needle-like leaves can be steeped into tea. Now, in most of the species that I've eaten, the sap in young shoots tasted absolutely horrible, but the pollen cones tasted pretty good. I'd recommend the pollen cones as food, but the sap in young shoots, in my opinion, aren't really fit for consumption. Except for the resources that we just covered for January, Michigan doesn't have much to offer foragers in February. But it does have one thing, and it's a very good thing. That thing is maple syrup.
seven species of maple trees are native to Michigan, and all of them can be tapped for their sap. But before we do that, we need to identify them. And we do that by looking for trees with opposite leaf scars and three bundle scars within each leaf scar. Now, a leaf scar is left when a leaf falls off a twig. And a bundle scar typically looks like a small dot within a leaf scar. In winter, leaf scars and bundle scars, as well as bark and twigs, are all very helpful in the process of identification. And a little bit later in the season, the dry, winged, one-seeded fruit structures called double samaras will easily identify maple trees. Making maple syrup is a long, arduous process, but there's nothing complicated about it. All you do is make a small cut in the tree, collect the sap drip by drip, and then boil the sap into syrup. Another way is to drill a hole into the tree and pound a spile into the hole, but all you really need to do is make a small cut with a knife and place a container under the drip. After you collect your sap, You'll definitely be boiling it for a while, but I'm pretty sure you'll agree that the results were worth the wait. Since we won't be covering maple trees later, I should mention that in addition to sap, most maple trees also have edible buds, leaves, flowers, and young samaras. So even long after the sap stops flowing, these trees continue to provide us with valuable resources. Now, in my opinion, the buds and leaves taste rather bitter, but the flowers and young samaras taste okay. March is when the growing season begins in Michigan, at least in the southern part of the state. Everything is always a week or two later in the northern part of the state. In March, Michigan foragers should be looking for dandelions, violets, and spring beauties. All of those plants have edible leaves, plus dandelions have edible tap roots, and spring beauties have edible tubers. Also in March, Michigan foragers should be looking for members of the mustard family, many of which have edible roots, leaves, flowers, and, later in the growing season, edible seeds. Now, since spring is such a good time for harvesting leaves, and leaves are so important in the process of identification, let's take a minute to learn how botanists look at leaves. When botanists look at leaves, they divide leaves into three main parts, the stalks, stipules, and blades. And they divide the blades into four main regions, the bases, tips, margins, and surfaces. Now, sometimes leaves don't have stalks or stipules, but they almost always have blades. And the various regions of the blades provide us with all kinds of useful information.
Another thing that botanists do when they look at leaves is they determine if the leaves are simple or compound. Simple means that the leaves are not divided into leaflets, and compound means that the leaves are divided into leaflets. Observing this feature is easy, and the terms simple and compound can be applied to all kinds of different parts, not just leaves. And one last thing that botanists do when they look at leaves is they look at the arrangement of the leaves, and the most common arrangements are called alternate, opposite, and world. Alternate means that each leaf connects to the stem at a different point. Opposite means that two leaves connect to the stem at each point, and world means that three or more leaves encircle the stem at each point. I should also mention that botanists have all kinds of complicated words for describing leaves, but since most of those words can be replaced with common words that we're all familiar with, we'll just stick to the common words in this class. Although many people consider dandelions to be noxious weeds, from a forager's perspective, dandelions are among the best plants on earth. Only two species are common in Michigan, and since both of them can be used in all the same ways, confusing them is of no consequence to foragers. Now, to be sure that you have a dandelion rather than something else that looks like a dandelion, make sure that the plant is stemless, and that the flower heads consist entirely of yellow ray flowers, and that the fluffy fruit structures, which are called sipsli, have well-developed beaks, hair-like papi, and sharp bumps on their bodies. Now, I know these parts probably sound a little strange, but dandelions are in the sunflower family, and any time you identify things in that family, you need to check all those parts very carefully. So, once you're sure that you have a dandelion, harvest all you want. Dandelions are mild-flavored, safe to eat, fresh or cooked, and undoubtedly one of the most abundant plants on Earth.
Violets are small, low-growing plants with edible leaves and flowers. Michigan has about 25 species of violets, and a few well-respected authors indicate that all violets are edible. Now, as a precaution, I'd recommend that you only eat species with a well-documented history of being eaten, but all of them should be safe to eat. In my opinion, the common blue violet is an excellent choice. It's well documented and its leaves and flowers make a fine addition to salads. As for identifying violets, that's a little bit complicated to explain in just a few sentences, so we won't be getting into that. But I will say that their flowers are fairly distinctive, and those flowers are usually white, yellow, or, as you may have guessed, violet. Spring beauties are another fine item on the March menu. These plants grow in abundance on the forest floor, but if you're not paying attention, you could walk right past them. Spring beauties are very small plants that usually bloom before the trees have leaves, and if you're looking in the right place at the right time, you'll find colonies of them that are ready to harvest. Now, harvesting spring beauties is going to take some time, it's not that they're difficult to harvest, but rather the tubers they produce are small, so you'll need to harvest quite a few tubers to make a meal. As for the flavor of those tubers, it's virtually identical to potatoes, so there are no problems with the flavor. Michigan has two species of spring beauties. And the most obvious features are their five pinkish petals with purplish veins, two opposite leaves, two sepals, and globe-shaped tubers. Both species have edible leaves and edible tubers, but it's mainly the tubers that are of interest to foragers, and that's because the tubers provide a lot more food value. It's easy to forget that roots are an important part of plants, and that sometimes the only difference between two plants is what lies underground. Foragers should know that the two most common types of roots are tap roots and fibrous roots, and the difference between them is that tap roots look like the carrots you see in grocery stores, and fibrous roots look like a tangled mess of strings. Another resource that foragers definitely need to be familiar with is mustards. Michigan has about a hundred species of mustards, and quite a few of them are edible. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that they're all edible, or that they all look the same or taste the same, but I am saying you'll definitely notice a lot of similarities between them. 
For example, quite a few species have flowers with four sepals, four petals, six stamens, and seed pods that split into two halves. Also, in the edible species, quite a few of them are spicy when eaten fresh and mild after cooking, and they also have a spicy aroma that can help us identify them. Aromas may not seem like they'd be very helpful for identifying plants, but they're actually very helpful in the process, so don't forget about your sense of smell. Another thing worth noting about mustards is that quite a few of them have a similar growth form. That form is clusters of basil leaves, smaller leaves that alternate up the stems, and flowers arranged in racemes. Again, not every mustard will have this form, but many of them do, and being able to recognize mustards is a good skill to have. In Michigan, some of the best mustards include watercress, wintercress, pennycress, pepperweeds, and a noxious weed called garlic mustard. Actually, everything that we just covered for March is probably more abundant in April, so definitely be on the lookout for all those things in April, and also be on the lookout for wild leeks and asparagus. Of all the roots and root-like parts that I've ever gathered, the bulbs of wild leeks were undoubtedly the easiest to gather. Very few wild foods can be gathered so efficiently, and that's a big part of what makes wild leeks so valuable. That and their delicious onion-like flavor. Wild leeks are in what botanists call the Allium genus, and this genus can be identified by its onion or garlic-like aroma, leaves with parallel veins, and flowers with three sepals, three petals, and six stamens. Also, the flowers will always be arranged in umbels, which means that all the flower stalks emerge from one point those features will effectively identify the Allium genus. But to identify wild leeks, you also need to check the leaves, and those leaves should be a lot wider than the leaves of other species. For the most part, anything you can do with cultivated onions, you can also do with wild leeks. Now, wild leeks are a lot smaller than cultivated onions, but regardless of their size, they're delicious when dipped in batter and sautéed, or when tossed into a stir-fry or rolled into a burrito. There are lots of good culinary options, and those options are available all year long, because the gathering season is all year long. Now, it's easier to find wild leeks in spring, but you can also gather them in summer when their flowers bloom, or in autumn when their seeds mature, or even in winter if you can remember where the colonies were located.
Another good resource of April is asparagus, but only the young shoots of this plant are edible. Other parts should not be eaten. Now, finding the young shoots can be a little bit tricky, but it helps to look for old dry plants from the previous year because those old dry plants are a lot easier to spot. And once you spot them, you'll see the young shoots emerging from their bases. It also helps to know in advance where colonies of asparagus are located. And you do that by finding the colonies one year and then returning to those colonies the following year. It's an effective strategy that works well with many different wild foods. Only one species of asparagus is found in Michigan, and it's the same species that's cultivated. So anything you can do with cultivated asparagus, you can also do with asparagus growing in the wild. Of course, what can you really do with asparagus other than try to smother its flavor with things that actually taste good? Asparagus may not be one of the more palatable wild foods, but it is abundant. Most of the March and April items that we just covered are also available in May, so definitely be on the lookout for them in May. And also be on the lookout for clovers, plantains, and black locust flowers. They say that April showers bring May flowers. And although the saying is certainly true in Michigan, it's also not quite the whole picture. You see, a lot of plants actually prefer to bloom in June, July, or even August. So it's not unusual to see more flowers in those months than in May. And since flowers are so important in the process of identification, let's shift gears for a few minutes and talk about some things that foragers should know about flowers. So, first of all, flowers, when present, are one of the most unique and sophisticated structures of plants. No other parts, except occasionally the fruits, provide a more reliable means of identifying plants. And flowers are often edible in the same way that leaves are edible, so don't overlook them when gathering salad material. Second of all, flowers will typically have sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. But sometimes, some of these parts are absent, and other times, additional parts may be present. Collectively, the petals are called a corolla, and this term is often used when the petals are united, even if they're only partially united. Now, whether the petals are free from each other, united, or absent, may not seem like a very big deal. But it is a big deal and it divides flowers into three major categories. Another big deal is the stamens and pistils. Stamens produce pollen that's intended to fertilize the pistils, and pistils develop into fruits, which contain seeds that develop into the next generation of plants, assuming everything goes as planned in the life cycle. Now, flowers can be male, female, both, or neither, and these genders are determined by the presence or absence of stamens and pistils. Another useful concept is whether the flowers are radially or bilaterally symmetrical. Radially symmetrical means similar in the way that slices of a pie are similar and bilaterally symmetrical means similar in the way that the wings of butterflies are similar. It's an obvious difference, and for the sake of simplicity, the words regular and irregular are commonly used to indicate those options. The numbers, colors, and positions of things are also very important. 
An example would be the position of the petals in relation to the ovaries. If the ovaries are below where the petals attach, the flowers are said to be ovary inferior. And if the ovaries are above where the petals attach, the flowers are said to be ovary superior. Now, I know these terms probably sound a little bit complicated, but there's nothing complicated about observing this feature, and it's a feature that can really help you identify plants. And one last thing that can really help is understanding the most common ways that flowers can be arranged, and those ways are called spikes, racemes, panicles, chymes, umbels, and heads. Now, in a spike, the individual flowers attach directly to the axis of the flower cluster, and those individual flowers do not have stalks. A raceme is essentially the same thing as a spike, except that the individual flowers do have stalks. And in both of these arrangements, the axis does not branch, so if you see it branching, then the arrangement is called a panicle. In chymes, the flower stalks emerge from other flower stalks and form all kinds of different patterns, such as coils, fans, and zigzags. Chymes can also resemble umbels, but in umbels, all the flower stalks emerge from one point rather than from other flower stalks. And last but not least, we have heads. Heads are basically just dense clusters of flowers. Now, these aren't the only ways that flowers can be arranged, but they are some of the most common ways, and foragers should definitely be able to recognize them. So that's a few things that foragers should know about flowers. Now, it's certainly not everything there is to know, but it is a good start, and we'll learn more as we continue. Michigan has eight species of clovers, but the notes here apply only to red and white clovers. Now, those species aren't native to Michigan, but they're now found in almost every lawn and field in the state, so they're definitely worth knowing about. As for what foragers should know about them, both of these plants have edible leaves and flowers, and it's better to eat these parts cooked than raw because cooking them makes them easier to digest. I would also say that cooking them improves their flavor, but that's just my opinion. As for harvesting clovers, there's nothing difficult about harvesting them, but you should probably do it sooner rather than later, and that's because bugs and diseases can do a lot of damage. You can probably still find some healthy plants later in the season, but the selection will undoubtedly be more limited. As for identifying clovers, you're looking for small plants with pea-like flowers arranged in heads and trifoliate leaves. Trifoliate means that a leaf has three leaflets, and pea-like means that a flower has banner, wing, and keel petals typical of the pea family. And one last thing that's worth mentioning about clovers is clover flower tea. Even if you don't normally like tea, or even anyone who even drinks tea, this one is pretty good.
The other thing I said to be on the lookout for in May was plantains, and that's because plantains are an excellent source of leaves and seeds. Now, the seeds won't be ready until August, but the leaves can be gathered when they come up in May, or any time they look healthy. The gathering season for plantains includes most of the year. Michigan has nine species of plantains, but the notes here apply only to broadleaf and narrowleaf plantain, which are the two most common species in the state. And to help you recognize those species, look for small plants with clusters of basil leaves and a bunch of flower stalks arising from those clusters. Individual flowers will have four sepals, four petals, and four stamens and they'll eventually develop into plump little capsules that dry out and split open around their equators. As for harvesting and processing plantains, those tasks are exceptionally easy. Other than washing, the leaves don't need to be processed. They can be eaten fresh. And later in the season, when the plants dry out and turn brown, you can harvest the seeds by simply rubbing the seed heads. The seeds will fall out, and the chaff will blow away. And once you have the seeds, you can toast them into a delicious meal. The flowers of black locust trees are another potential wild food, and the fact that they bloom so profusely makes them easy to find and easy to gather. It won't take you very long to gather enough for a meal, and to prepare them, you can either add them to soup or toss them into pancake batter. As for eating them raw, that might not be safe, but they are safe after they're cooked. Eventually, the flowers develop into bean pods, and these bean pods are generally considered to be inedible, despite a few sources that say otherwise. Frankly, I would not suggest using the bean pods as food, and that's because Native Americans, for the most part, did not use them as food. And just so you know, bean pods growing in the wild are often quite dangerous, so as a general rule, avoid them. Up until this point, most of the wild foods that we've been covering have been roots and leaves, but that changes in June when we start to see the first fruits of the growing season. And the first fruits are usually wild strawberries, service berries, and mulberries. We're all familiar with fruits, but what exactly are fruits from a botanical perspective? Botanists define fruits as the mature ovaries of flowering plants together with any accessory parts. And when they look at fruits, there are three main things that they're looking at. Number one, they're looking to see if the fruits are dry or fleshy. Number two, they're looking to see if the fruits split apart or don't split apart at maturity. And number three, they're looking at the internal layout of the fruits. These three simple things are the most important aspects of understanding fruits, so foragers should definitely remember them. And foragers should also remember that fruits should always match descriptions, because if they don't match, then you probably have the wrong plant. Fruits are very distinctive, sometimes even more distinctive than the flowers, so always check them very carefully.
Wild strawberries are delicious little fruits, but if you want to gather enough of them for a meal, well, you're going to be gathering them for a while. And when you gather them, you'll be competing with all the little animals in the forest that are also trying to gather those fruits. Other than that, wild strawberries are nothing but good news, and they're easy to identify. Just look for low-growing plants connected by stolons, trifoliate leaves arising from those stolons, white flowers with five petals, and, of course, strawberry-like fruits. Now, stolons, which are also called runners, are stem-like structures that connect plants to other plants, much like the rhizomes we learned about earlier, but above ground rather than below ground. Stolons are always above ground. Michigan has two species of wild strawberries, and anything you can do with cultivated strawberries, you can also do with the wild ones. Service berries, which are also called June berries, are definitely worth knowing about. However, they have some issues. Wild foods in general have a lot of issues, so don't be surprised to see an entire harvest wiped out by bugs, diseases, or bad weather. This happens frequently, and with service berries, it's diseases. Service berry shrubs and trees are plagued by some kind of fungus that attacks almost every part of them, including the fruits. But sometimes, the fruits are perfectly healthy. And if you can manage to find some healthy ones, they're absolutely delicious, fresh or cooked. Mulberries are another fruit that ripens in June or July, and identifying them is easy. Just look for shrubs or trees with raspberry-like fruits and mitten-like leaves. In Michigan, only mulberries will have that combination of features, and only two species of mulberries are found in the state, red mulberry and white mulberry. The notes here are mainly for red mulberry, but both species have edible fruits, assuming the fruits are fully ripe. With mulberries, it's important to gather the fruits when they're fully ripe. So, why are mulberries so important to foragers? Well, it's because they produce an abundance of fruits that are easy to harvest, easy to process, nutritious, and delicious. And so far, I've never seen them fail to produce a crop. You see, some wild foods only produce a crop once every few years, and that creates a real problem for foragers in between those years. Thankfully, mulberries are not like that. You can count on them to produce a crop every year. As for processing mulberries, you can use them to make pies, jellies, fruit bars, fruit smoothies, or just about anything else you can do with fruits. You can also eat them fresh if you don't want to process them. And unlike raspberries, the seeds of mulberries are usually soft enough to chew. Back in January, we learned that cattails have edible rhizomes and edible seeds. 
but cattails also have edible stem bases, flowers, and pollen. And all of these are good resources. If you ever take apart a cattail, you'll see that the stem bases have a starchy interior that's wrapped by the leaf bases. You need to peel off the leaf bases to get at the stem bases, but this is easy to do, and you'll be glad you did it. Gathering the stem bases is much easier than gathering the rhizomes, and you can gather the stem bases from the end of spring to the end of summer. As for cattail flowers, I would say that the male flowers are a better wild food than the female flowers, and that's because the male flowers are easier to chew, and they contain all the pollen. Pollen is actually a nutritious food, but we usually don't eat it because it's difficult to gather and it tends to cause allergies. In cattails, the pollen probably will cause allergies when you gather it, but at least it's easy to gather. When fresh, Cattail pollen is moist, yellow, and about the consistency of stone ground corn flour, and the only thing you need to do to process it is to dry it, and you want to do that right away because it's extremely perishable. As for its flavor, I would say that it's similar to scrambled eggs. Throughout the ages, cattails were an important source of food for native peoples around the world. And to identify this food, just look for sausage-like flower clusters and grass-like leaves. It's an easy combination to remember. And just to be cautious, always watch out for poison sumac when you gather cattails, because both of them grow in the same habitat. Common milkweed is another good resource of June, as well as July and August, but it's very important that you gather the right species and that you thoroughly cook the plant. Most milkweeds are poisonous, and the ones that are edible need to be cooked. Michigan has about 12 species of milkweeds, and the notes here apply only to common milkweed. Historically, common milkweed was an important source of food wherever it grew, and considering the extent to which it was utilized, it's clear that it's safe to eat after it's cooked. The edible parts include the young shoots, young leaves, flower buds, flowers, and young fruits. And to prepare these parts, it's wise to blanch them in boiling water before cooking them. And that's because blanching them helps remove any harmful compounds. As for the flavor of the various parts, it's actually pretty good. You may have some bitterness occasionally, but overall the flavor, at least in my opinion, is palatable. Like its name indicates, common milkweed is indeed a very common plant, and to identify it, Look for its distinctive pinkish-purple flowers with hoods and horns, broad, oppositely arranged leaves with leaf stalks, and petals that are bent downward and hairy on the backsides. And, like most milkweeds, the various parts will exude a milky latex when cut, hence the name milkweed. Now, I know that may seem like a lot of features to check, and that some of those features may seem a little obscure, 
but you need to check all those features to make sure that you have the right species. Another resource that becomes available in June and continues to be available for the next few months is stinging nettle. Now, considering all the stinging hairs covering this plant, I can understand any aversions that people might have to eating it. However, it really is completely harmless after it's cooked. And not only is it completely harmless, it's remarkably nutritious. The leaves are the part that you eat. And to prepare them, you can simply toss them into a pot of boiling water. In less than a minute, the hairs will be disarmed and you'll have a delicious meal. Michigan only has one species of nettle, and you'll definitely want to wear gloves when you gather it, as well as long pants and a long-sleeved shirt, and maybe a helmet and one of those suits that the astronauts wear when they go on space missions. I'm pretty sure that'll keep you safe when you're foraging through a nettle patch, and I think it might even keep all the mosquitoes off of you. As for identification, the most notable features of stinging nettle are simple leaves ranged oppositely, narrow, drooping flower spikes emerging from the leaf axles, and of course, the stinging hairs covering just about all the parts. In addition, stinging nettle is a tall plant, so it's hard to miss. July is a great month for foraging in Michigan, with resources like raspberries, blueberries, and a wide variety of green leafy vegetables becoming available at that time. Raspberries, as well as related plants called blackberries, thimbleberries, and dewberries, are among the most reliable wild foods in Michigan. But despite their names, they are not berries. Fruits in the Rubus genus are actually clusters of tiny droops, rather than berries, and that's important because the fruits help us identify the genus. You see, in a berry, all the layers of the fruit are soft and fleshy. But in a droop, the innermost layer is hard and forms a shell around the seed. And those shells can be a real nuisance when you process the fruits, or when they get stuck in between your teeth.
In Michigan, there are 15 species in the Rubus genus, and all of them have edible fruits. I've personally tried six of those species, and the fruits were just as good as the ones sold in grocery stores. To process them, I toss them in a blender and then dry them into fruit bars. The blender grinds up the seeds so that they're almost unnoticeable in the final product. Making fruit bars is a great way to process just about any fruits, and seasonings like cinnamon, ginger, caraway, or coriander are always a welcome addition. As for the task of harvesting, I'd say watch out for the prickly stems, but other than that, it's remarkably easy. Now, not all the species have prickly stems, but in Michigan, most of them do, and the stems often look like they're arching out of the ground. It's a distinctive form, but it's only one of many forms seen in the Rubus genus. And some other features, seen in quite a few species, include compound leaves with double serrated margins and flowers with five sepals, five petals, numerous pistils, and numerous stamens. Plants or shrubs with all those features and raspberry-like fruits are definitely in the Rubus genus, and being able to recognize this genus is a good skill to have. Blueberries are a top-grade wild food ripening primarily from the middle of July to the end of August. Michigan has eight species of blueberries and three species of cranberries, which for some reason are also in the vaccine genus. All of these species have edible fruits, and these fruits are indeed berries, as a botanist would define the word, so they should always be completely soft, and they should never have hard stones. Another thing worth noting is that blueberries have urn-shaped flowers, which is a key feature of the heather family. In blueberries, those flowers are pinkish white and ovary inferior, which means that the ovaries are positioned below the sepals and petals. Any shrubs you find with all those features and simple leaves arranged alternately is definitely a blueberry. As for harvesting and processing, it might take a while to harvest enough blueberries depending on the patch that you're harvesting them from. But once you have them, all you have to do is wash them and they're ready to eat. No further processing is required. And if you're wondering about how they taste, they taste just as good as commercially grown blueberries, except for the ones that taste even better. Like just about any month of the year, July offers us an assortment of green leafy vegetables, including things like wild lettuce, wood sorrel, sow thistle, salsify, and purslane. All of these plants, or actually I should say groups of plants, are common in Michigan, so they're worth knowing about. Now, explaining every detail required to identify all of them would be a very long discussion. So instead of doing that, I'll just point out some key features and focus mainly on their edibility. Wild lettuce is certainly a plant worth knowing about, but it's nothing like cultivated lettuce. Compared to cultivated lettuce, wild lettuce is rather bitter. The young leaves are okay for salads, but you're probably going to want to cook the older leaves. 
When you're out there foraging in the Michigan woodlands, there's a good chance that you'll find wild lettuce. With a height of up to 10 feet tall, it usually stands above most of the other plants, so it's not too hard to find. And if you do find it, you notice that you won't need too many leaves to make a salad, as each leaf can be over a foot long. Wood sorrels are distinctive little plants that make an excellent addition to salads. You won't find them standing above too many plants, but you will find them just about everywhere they have a chance to grow. They prefer woodlands and can be identified by looking at their leaves. Each leaf has three heart-shaped leaflets, and each leaflet is folded down the middle. Those features, in combination with yellow or purple, five-petaled flowers, and long, narrow seed capsules, is a sure sign of wood sorrels. Sow thistles are common weeds that invade fields, roadsides, vacant lots, and many other places in the city and country. Three species are found in Michigan, and all three of them have edible leaves. But in order to use those leaves, you need to trim the spines off their margins. You can also try boiling the leaves to soften the spines, but that may not be effective if the leaves are old or if the spines are stiff. Sow thistles actually look more like dandelions than thistles, but remember that dandelions never have stems, and sow thistles always have stems. These plants also have quite a few other differences, but that one is pretty obvious. Salsifies are another source of green leafy vegetables available in June, July, and August. You can also eat the roots of all three species in Michigan, but you need to gather the roots before the stems develop, and it can be a little bit tricky to identify the plants at that time. When eaten fresh, salsify leaves taste very similar to romaine lettuce. They make an excellent addition to salads, and they're equally suitable as pot herbs, at least in my opinion. As for the task of gathering, gathering salsify leaves is easy, so it's not going to take you all day to gather enough for a meal. And the same could be said about the other plants that we just covered for July. Common purslane doesn't grow more than a few inches tall, but it can cover large areas of open ground at a record pace. It especially likes agricultural fields or sandy or gravelly areas where there's not too much competition from other plants. Leaves of common purslane are completely safe and nutritious, and they're also thick, fleshy, mild-flavored, and a little bit slimy. In the past, these leaves were sold in grocery stores, but these days, you're more likely to find them growing in the parking lots of grocery stores rather than inside the stores. And one last note for July is wild bergamot. The leaves and flowers of this plant can be added to salads, cooked as pot herbs, or steeped into tea. Wild bergamot is a member of the mint family, and like so many members of this family, it has square stems, opposite leaves, and a minty aroma. It's very common in Michigan, and it's not that hard to identify. So if you need something that works as a seasoning, or something to steep into tea, feel free to try wild bergamot. August is a very busy month for foragers. A lot of good resources become available in August and continue to be available into September. Resources like grass seeds, cherries, 
elderberries, sumac fruits, autumn olives, wild carrots, burdock, and chicory, just to name a few. Grasses may not look very attractive, but they do more to feed the world than any other plants, so don't underestimate their importance to the art of foraging. Foragers should always be checking grasses for seeds, especially in August and September, and the way you check them is you simply rub the seed heads. If seeds fall out, great, and if they don't fall out, well then just try a different one. Now, sometimes when you rub the seed heads, you end up with a lot of chaff in addition to the seeds, but you can usually separate the two by placing them in a bowl and tossing them up in the air on a windy day. The chaff, which is lightweight, blows away in the wind, and the seeds, which are heavier, fall back into the bowl. This process is called winnowing, and most of the time, it's an effective way to separate seeds from chaff. Of all the various parts of plants, seeds are the most valuable in terms of nutrition. So if you're wondering where you should focus your foraging efforts, focus those efforts on harvesting seeds, especially grass seeds. Your meal is in the meadows. A lot of different fruits ripen in August, and cherries are one of them. Michigan has seven species of cherries, but only four of them are common. Now, if you decide to harvest cherries, keep in mind that only the flesh of the fruit is safe to eat. The pits are poisonous. You should also keep in mind that cherries are always droops, which means they will always be fleshy fruits with one pit filled with one seed. So if you ever find a fruit that looks like a cherry, but has more than one pit or more than one seed, then it's definitely not a cherry. As for processing, just about everything you can do with commercially grown cherries, you can also do with the wild ones. But keep in mind that the wild ones are usually a lot smaller, and they always have pits. To remove the pits, simply squeeze the fruits. The pits will slide right out. After that, the cherries can be eaten fresh or dried in the sun. When eaten fresh, wild cherries can be sweet, tart, or bland. The flavor depends on the species. To help you recognize cherries, look for shrubs or trees with simple leaves ranged alternately, smooth bark marked with lenticels, flowers with five sepals, five petals, one pistil, and numerous stamens, and of course, the cherry-like fruits. Elderberries are a wild food that Michigan foragers should definitely know about. Only two species are found in the state, and the one known as black elderberry is much safer than the other one known as red elderberry. 
Black elderberries are safe to eat, raw or cooked, but red elderberries absolutely need to be cooked. Also, if you decide to harvest elderberries, you need to make sure that they're fully ripe. This video is about black elderberries, which, in addition to being safer, also taste much better than red elderberries. Now, if you've never had black elderberries, they have a sweet yet somewhat odd flavor, and the seeds inside them have a delicately crunchy texture. For technical reasons, elderberries are not actually berries, but since they're soft enough, you can use them in the same ways as berries. As for harvesting black elderberries, that job couldn't be much easier, and that's a big part of why they're so valuable to foragers. Black elderberries are produced on shrubs, and not only are those shrubs highly productive, they're easy to identify. To identify them, you're looking for pinnate leaves arranged oppositely, creamy white flowers, and clusters of purplish black fruits. Only black elderberry shrubs will have that combination of features. Another legendary wild food is sumac fruits, and when I say sumac in this video, I'm referring to species in the Rus genus, and I'm absolutely not referring to poison sumac of the Toxicodendron genus. Now, confusing the fruits of these species is highly unlikely, as the edible ones are red and hairy, and the poisonous ones are white and hairless. So, if you've never had sumac fruits, then you need to know that they're basically just hairy skins covering hard stones. Their fleshy portions are very, very thin, but what they lack in thickness, they make up for in sweetness and tartness. Of all the wild fruits that I've ever eaten, sumac fruits were undoubtedly the sweetest. They taste as good as candy, but beware, if you eat them raw, the hairs covering them can be irritating. Now, one way to avoid issues with the hairs is to prepare the fruits as a beverage. To prepare this sumac beverage, simply soak the fruits in cold water for about 20 to 30 minutes and then filter the water. Mashing the fruits as they're soaking will help liberate the sugars, and filtering the mess will get rid of all the seeds and any loose hairs. You can also boil the beverage as a final step to sterilize it. This beverage, which is commonly called sumac lemonade, was popular among Native Americans and is still popular today. Sumacs seem to have a tropical look that's a little bit out of place this far north, but they're certainly a welcome addition to the Michigan landscape. In early summer, they have greenish yellow flowers at the tips of their branches, and in late summer, those flowers become clusters of red hairy fruits. It's a distinctive form that's very easy to recognize.
As its name suggests, autumn olive produces olive-like fruits in autumn. But unlike its name suggests, it's not even related to olives. Autumn olive is a shrub of the oleaster family that produces little red fruits that can be eaten raw or cooked. As for the flavor of those fruits, I would say it's an excellent flavor. The texture is rather crunchy, but the flavor is sweet, fruity, and tangy. As for the task of harvesting, that's not really much of a task. Autumn olives couldn't be much easier to harvest. As they ripen, they turn from dull green to bright red or reddish orange, and you should only harvest them when they're fully ripe. You should also harvest them right away, because they don't persist for very long. Autumn olive shrubs are about one to seven meters tall silvery green, and covered with dot-like scales. Even the fruits have dot-like scales, and this feature in combination with oval leaves arranged alternately, and creamy white flowers with four lobes and four stamens, will confirm that you have an autumn olive. Wild carrots are considered to be weeds in Michigan, so there's definitely an ample supply of this wild food. The roots are the main part of interest to foragers, but the leaves and flowers are also edible. Now, the roots are rather small, but they're not that hard to gather. As for their flavor and aroma, those aspects are similar to cultivated carrots. However, they can be a lot stronger. The resins that give wild carrots their pleasant aroma can ruin their flavor, and cooking may not be able to fix it. When you gather the roots of wild carrots, it's imperative that you gather them before the plants develop stems, because after that point, they become tough, woody, and excessively resinous. It's also imperative that you don't confuse the plants with spotted hemlock or water hemlock because those are the most dangerous plants in North America. All of these plants have white flowers arranged in compound umbels, but the umbels of wild carrots are subtended by fork-like bracts, a feature not seen in the hemlocks. Plus, the fruits and flowers of wild carrots are bristly, and those of the hemlocks are not. Now, these aren't the only ways to differentiate these plants, but they are the easiest and most reliable ways. So, assuming that you have wild carrots, and that you gathered them before their stems developed, I think you'll agree that they're a decent wild food. Common burdock is a valuable plant to foragers, especially as a source of roots. Now, the stems and leaf stalks are also edible, but it's mainly the roots that are of interest. Common burdock roots can be eaten raw or cooked, but in my opinion, they're better cooked. 
because cooking brings out their starchy flavor and softens their texture. For the most part, anything you can do with commercially grown carrots, you can also do with burdock roots. And burdock roots that you gather from the wild are just as big as commercially grown carrots, sometimes even bigger. That's what makes them so valuable to foragers. So, how do we find common burdock? And how can we be sure that it really is what we think it is? Well, with a height anywhere from 4 to 10 feet tall, a forager shouldn't have any trouble finding this plant. And all the burrs covering it should make it easy enough to identify. Common burdock is what botanists call a biennial plant, which means that it lives for two years. In its first year, it looks like a cluster of giant, hairy, heart-shaped leaves rising out of the ground. And in its second year, it develops thick stems, purple flowers, and of course, the spiny burrs for which it's named. As with most biennial plants, gathering the roots should be done any time before the stems develop, because after that point, the roots become tough and woody and you can be sure that gathering the roots is a workout. Chicory is another fantastic plant with edible roots and leaves, and these parts have an excellent flavor. The leaves are basically a robust version of endive lettuce. You can eat them fresh or cooked, and they're good either way, except that occasionally they can be hairy. As for the roots, how you prepare them determines how they will taste. Eaten raw, they taste rather bland and earthy. Boiling them brings out a starchy flavor, and charring them brings out a coffee-like flavor. Chicory roots have long been used as a substitute for coffee, so if you like coffee more than tea, you might want to try these roots. Chicory is considered a weed on every continent except Antarctica, and its dandelion-like leaves, light blue ray flowers, and sipsily with irregular crowns will readily distinguish it. All the items that we just covered for August are also available in September, so you can add all those items to the September menu. September marks the end of summer and the beginning of autumn, and as the seasons change, a forager needs to start planning for what lies ahead. Winter may seem like it's a long way away, but it approaches fast, and the time to prepare for it is in August, September, and October, when there's still an abundance of wild foods, wild foods like grapes, currants, and gooseberries.
Grapes are an excellent resource, and the fact that they grow on vines greatly assists in the process of identifying them. Not too many wild foods grow on vines, so the few that do are not that hard to recognize. Now, to be sure that you have a grape vine, look for three things. Simple leaves with toothed margins, tendrils, and of course, clusters of grapes. Only grape vines will have all those features, and similar looking vines such as Virginia creeper and moonseed will not have all those features. Michigan has four species of grapes, and although all of them have edible fruits and leaves, this video is about riverbank grape, the most common species in Michigan. Compared to cultivated grapes, riverbank grapes are small, and like all grapes grown in the wild, they're filled with seeds. Now, the seeds are soft enough to chew, but the shells of the seeds are extremely crunchy. And since the shells have a bad habit of splintering into sharp fragments when you eat them, you'll probably want to spit them out, or filter them out when you process the grapes. When eaten fresh, riverbank grapes are very sweet and very tart, much more tart than cultivated grapes. I would say they're delicious but they may not be quite what you're expecting if the only grapes you've ever had were from grocery stores. To process riverbank grapes, you have a few options, but the best option, in my opinion, is to pull the grapes off the clusters, rinse them in clean water, run them through a blender, and then filter them to remove all the seed fragments. This process is quick and effective and will give you grape juice that's ready to drink. Now, if you need something that's not so perishable, you can simply boil this juice into a thick paste and then dry the paste into fruit bars. In the wild, grapevines are well known for sprawling over shrubs, climbing on trees, and generally making the place look like a jungle. Of course, this is a welcome sight to a hungry forager. Michigan has 12 species of currants and gooseberries, and all of them produce edible fruits. Now, in some species, the fruits are spiny or don't taste very good, but they are edible. In general, currants and gooseberries taste good, but they often have unusual accents, and based on the ones that I've eaten, the pulp seems to be much sweeter than the seeds. As for the task of harvesting, whether that's easy or difficult will depend on which species you're harvesting. Some species are a lot spinier than others, and dodging all those spines will slow you down. Also, 
Some species have solitary berries rather than clusters of berries, and that can make a big difference in the time it takes you to harvest them. The berries can actually be expected any time from June to October, depending on the species, but some should be ready in September. And since they can be eaten raw, no processing is required, unless they're spiny. Now, if the berries are spiny, I'd recommend that you burn the spines off, and that's because boiling the berries may not adequately soften the spines. To identify currants and gooseberries, look for shrubs with palmately lobed leaves arranged alternately or in clusters. Then, check the aroma of those leaves, because it's often very distinctive. And when I say distinctive, I don't necessarily mean pleasant. After doing that, check the flowers. They should be ovary inferior and shaped like a bowl, cup, or tube. And each one should have five sepals, five petals, and five stamens. And last but not least, make sure that the fruits are indeed berries. In Michigan, only currants and gooseberries will have all those features, and being able to recognize these shrubs is a good skill to have. October is an excellent month to be foraging in Michigan, and that's because acorns, walnuts, hickory nuts, and if you're lucky, chestnuts fall to the ground in October, thus providing foragers with an abundance of highly valuable wild foods. And just in case that's not enough good news, some of the most valuable seeds are also available in October, including amaranth and goosefoot seeds. In the past, the acorns of oak shrubs and oak trees were a staple of life, but in modern times, they've been replaced by more preferable foods. Acorns are the fruit structures of oaks, and only oaks produce them, so the presence of acorns is a sure sign of oaks. But what exactly does an acorn look like, and is there anything poisonous that we might confuse them with? Well, in Michigan, there's nothing poisonous that looks like an acorn. And an acorn will always contain one seed surrounded by a thin shell that's loosely positioned within a cup-like structure called an involucre. Also, an acorn will never split open at maturity. So if you ever find a nut-like fruit that splits open at maturity or contains more than one seed, then it's definitely not an acorn. All oaks produce edible acorns, but the acorns need to be processed. To process them, I would suggest making acorn flour. And this is done by cracking the shells and picking out the nut meat, pounding the nut meat into a coarse meal, boiling the meal to remove the tannins, toasting the meal to bring out its nutty flavor, and then grinding the meal into flour. Acorn flour is a versatile, nutritious, ready-to-eat food that can be stored for several months. And based on my experiences, I would say that it tastes very similar to hazelnut flour. Of course, if you've never had hazelnut flour, well, <laughs> that tastes like acorn flour. <laughs> and hopefully that clarifies things. As for the task of harvesting acorns, the oaks make that easy for us by conveniently dropping them. 
so there's no need to climb the trees. The acorns will come to us when they're ready, and they can be harvested off the ground for quite a while after they've fallen. Oaks are a dominant part of the landscape across the northern hemisphere, and they're well adapted to a variety of climates. Almost anywhere you go in the northern hemisphere, including just about everywhere in Michigan, you'll find oaks. Throughout the ages, walnuts have been an important source of food, and they continue to be an important source of food into the foreseeable future. Only two species of walnut trees are found in Michigan, and since black walnuts is by far the most common species, we'll focus on that one. Although most people probably wouldn't consider walnuts to be fruits, walnuts are indeed fruits, and since only walnut trees produce them, they're very easy to recognize, even in winter, long after they've fallen off the trees. As for harvesting and processing, harvesting walnuts is easy, but processing them is a chore. To harvest them, just wait until they fall to the ground, and to process them, I would suggest cutting off the husks with a knife, cracking the shells open with a hammer, picking out the nut meat, and then roasting the nut meat to bring out its flavor. This method of preparation is about as close to quick and easy as you'll get, but you should keep in mind that if you're planning on storing your walnuts, then it's better to leave them in their shells and crack them open whenever you're ready. Now, if you store them like this, be sure to store them in a cool, dry place where they can breathe. Fresh walnuts are moist, and that moisture needs a way to escape. I should also mention that regardless of how you process walnuts, removing the husks is a very messy job, so it's a good idea to wear gloves and old clothing when doing that job. And to identify black walnut trees, just look for pinnate leaves arranged alternately, and of course, the walnuts. The nuts of hickory trees are also edible, but those of some species are much better than those of other species. The notes here apply only to a species called shagbark hickory, which produces excellent quality nuts that can be eaten fresh or cooked. When eaten fresh, shagbark hickory nuts taste like a combination of pecans and butter. In my opinion, they're the best nuts in Michigan. Now, you'll definitely spend some time cracking their shells but the nuts are undoubtedly worth all the effort. As for identifying this tree, its shaggy bark makes that easy, and that feature in combination with its distinctive nuts is a sure sign of shag bark hickory.
The various species of amaranth are another good resource, but in Michigan, these species are mainly limited to agricultural fields and other disturbed areas. All the species in Michigan produce edible seeds, and these seeds are easy to harvest, easy to process, nutritious, and mild-flavored. For the most part, anything you can do with whole grains, you can also do with amaranth seeds. Now, what makes amaranth so valuable to foragers is its ability to produce such an abundance of seeds. Even just one plant can produce enough seeds for a meal, and just one acre of plants can produce enough seeds for an entire season. In the past, amaranth was a staple of life that fed entire civilizations, much like wheat, rice, and corn do today. So definitely, be on the lookout for amaranth. Although some of the fruits that we covered in the previous months will persist into November, most of them will disappear. Not too many fruits actually ripen in November, but one that does is rose hips. Roses are prickly shrubs that produce distinctive fruits called rose hips. Botanically speaking, a rose hip is a cluster of achenes enclosed by a fleshy hypanthium. But since that definition probably doesn't help anyone, just think of a rose hip as a fleshy fruit filled with some extremely hard seeds. Also keep in mind that only roses produce rose hips. So the presence of these fruits on prickly shrubs with pinnate leaves is a sure sign of roses. As for edibility, all roses have edible hips, but the hips of some species are much better than those of other species. In some species, the hips are too small to effectively harvest and process, or they have irritating hairs that need to be dealt with. 
Harvesting rose hips is best done when they're slightly overripe. And you can tell when they're slightly overripe because their skin start to wrinkle and their flesh becomes soft like mashed potatoes. Sweetness is at a maximum at that point, and thanks to the cool weather of late autumn, the hips often stay fresh for quite a while. Sometimes they can even stay fresh all the way through winter. The real challenge with roses, aside from dodging all the prickles, is processing the hips. And the reason that's a challenge is because the akines are so hard. So, how do we overcome this challenge? Well, the easiest way is to simply chew the hips and spit them out. Another way is to cut the hips in half and brush them away. And yet another way is to make rose hip juice. To make this juice, simply boil the hips in water, mash the hips while they're boiling, and then filter out the debris. Overall, despite some difficulties in harvesting and processing, rose hips are an excellent wild food. As you probably expect, December is not really a good time to be foraging in Michigan. But even in December, a forager can still find things to eat. The question is what to look for, where to look for it, and is it still healthy enough to eat? In December, you can still find the withered remains of certain herbaceous plants that tell you where to dig for roots. Plants like wild carrots, wild leeks, and burdock. Now, there may not be much left of these plants in December, but sometimes there's enough to identify them. Another thing to look for is acorns and you look for them under oak trees. But how do you know which trees are the oak trees in December? Even though oak trees are deciduous, which means that they drop their leaves, those leaves may not drop until the middle of winter or even spring, and that makes oak trees stand out against the usual winter landscape. Now, the acorns under those trees may not be usable, but nevertheless, it's still a good place to look for food. And the same could be said about walnut and hickory trees. Also in December are all the wild foods that we started with back in January, which included rose hips, sumac fruits, cattail rhizomes, and the inner bark of pine trees. And that brings us full circle through the seasons, as seen from a forager's perspective in the state of Michigan. I hope this class was helpful, and I wish you good luck on your foraging endeavors. Farewell, and always, forage safe.